Akiesi Akiese, which is of course Yoruba for Achtung Achtung. Of course Yoruba it is. People can be, of course it is. They can be found throughout Western Africa, including Nigeria. And as we all know, many Nigerian soldiers fought in Burma and India, but came home to little fanfare or thanks from the British colonialists. This, in part, sparked the general strike of 1945 and led to an increased desire for self-determination. So, you know, sometimes the British army mishandling its soldiers uh, had a greater good in the long run for those peoples. <laughs> yes, that's one way of looking at it, isn't it? <laughs> well, no, because it's interesting, because um, uh, we're... By, uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. Um... Uh, you know what? I'm, uh, we're we're recording this the Friday, so last night was our um, live cast, and yes. so James and I were only speaking to each other um, twelve hours ago. So although we haven't <laughs> seen each other, you know, mano a mano for a little while, it feels yep. we still feel very close and tight. Yes, we do. This, this feels kind of old school as well that we're doing a just we're just doing a, um, a, a, a how we do this. Everyone is we do a Zoom chat. James is wherever he is. I tend to be in my office. And uh, we're, we're, we're just going to chew the cud and talk some questions. But we rather do look than at each having other. A, we do look at each other. So, yeah, and, yes, and, exactly. But rather than, rather than having a high pad academic on can completely blow your minds and make you rethink everything, or me waving a model tank about, um, which are, of course, the twin poles of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, that and the Piet, I suppose. The, the that and the Piet, of course. Ah, oh, the Piet. And, and, but and the I like it. I, I quite like the old school approach. I, I kind of think, yeah. you know, in recent weeks, I'm not sure we've done enough of it. And, you know, if we do go yeah. into lockdown, we can can do some more of it because it's great Absolutely. having experts on but but i do think the kind of you know the one-on-one is is and thra- yeah thrashing things out uh, this way. is and this is ladies and gentlemen dear listener this is the 201st edition of we have Get ways away. of you talk yeah 201st we're, we're into our double ton james that's amazing God, you ever, you ever scored, scored a, a, no i've never scored, scored a, a century ton. yeah i have I've got never a couple, never double. couple under belt I've got i've got four <laughs> 90s and two tons Wow. Were you nervous in the 90s? Yeah, always. Yeah, because I always count my <laughs> score. I'm really weird like that. So I count. Oh, really? I, know, I know within, I always know exactly what I'm on. And it's just, it's that kind of anxious moment of when I get to kind of 49 and is the scorer in time with me, um, which is always oh, man. Kind of, you know, there was, there was one time this actually first 50 I got this season. Um, I got to 50 um, and I was like, come on then. You know, where's where's the kind of the ripple of applause from the from the scorer and from the sideline? Nothing happened. Literally, next ball, I was out, and um, oh, no. so I went off really, really grumpy. And then they went, "Oh, don't worry. You know, you have got fifty. I I'm, I missed out. I I hadn't count, added it up wrong. Oh, so it's fine. So I had got my fifty. But you know. yeah, but still, you want that. You know. So yeah, first wanna... time I was at first time I got into the nineties. I, I mean, I'd never got. I mean, I think I got like an eighty once before, and a couple of seventies stuff. Yeah. I hadn't really got that close. So I was on. Yeah. I was on ninety five, and this guy <laughs> came on. He was bowling absolute pies, and, and he bowled this long hop, and I just my eyes just lit up. I thought, right, I'm gonna absolutely just twat this, and you know, six, yeah. to, six to hundred, and yeah. it just hit a little divot. No. Yeah, and, as, and I, it was too late. I was through the shot, uh, and I got this. I got this top edge, and it just went whoosh, literally vertically into the sky. And I said to the wiki, "Oh, please drop it." And he went, "Sorry, mate." <laughs> <laughs> and I had to trudge off. It was awful. It was almost worse. I'd almost wish I'd got out on eighty-two or something. It was terrible. <laughs> but anyway, it's since rectified, so that's all right. But actually, I, got, I did get. I got. A, I got hundred uh, last year. With yeah. my Spitfire bat. I've got oh, a Spitfire God. bat. Yes, yeah, so that, that was a perfect. That was, that was magic. Perfect, perfect We Have Ways moment. Well, anyway, well, James and I are ra- we're raising our bats to the pavilion and uh, <laughs> we plan to keep the scoreboard ticking over nightly. Nicely. And of course, if we do go into another lockdown, um, we, will, we will do what we can um, uh, to get more out. We're going to go Castle Bromwich on your ass, is what we're going to do. Yeah. And uh, enter a mass production phase. We don't need Lord Bree- Beaverbrook. To keep us going, we'll do, we can do it ourselves. Isn't that right, James? We yeah. can do it. We can do it. We, yeah. we, we don't. Yeah, yeah we don't need sort of you know notices up on the wall saying committees take the punch out of war. You know, we don't need that. No. No. We'll no, just, we we'll just do we it. Can, but we're also we planning a US it. week, aren't we? Yes, we've got some stuff coming up for Thanksgiving with some uh, uh, well, a veteran of Iwo Jima. Um, we've got uh, of, the bulge. Um, of the bulge and and some and some academical people too, and um, uh, from World of Tanks. It's <laughs> yeah, I love Nick Ryan. That is really, uh, it's really cool. That um, uh, because yeah, tell the story. You, you tell saying, the story. 
Well, I basically came across him. Um, uh, I, I thought, wow, this guy, this guy's approach because because World of Tanks, you know, they occu- they occupy a really interesting place in the sort of um, in the museum uh, firmament because they're they're a big a big co sponsor at um, at Bovington. And uh, and you know they have this they have this symbiotic relationship where they're allowed to sort of poke around inside the tanks, crawl all over them, have a proper look at them, um, uh, uh, in, rather like actually Mr. Tamio used to have back in the seventies and eighties, where they would they would let him crawl all over their panther so he could measure it and make it into a model, and uh, n- not a dissimilar relationship actually. And of course, there's the Tamio Hall at, at Bovington and World of Tanks, uh, uh, you know, a, a tied up. So I discovered him. I don't know. I, was just, I think I was I was just watching vid, vid lectures about tanks on YouTube, and I said, "You've got to look at this guy because he just yes." Yeah, because you sent me an email going, just going check this out. Yeah, yeah. Because he's just going no. That you've got to look at you're looking at completely the wrong way round. Um, uh, you, you know, consider the fact they may have thought of this. I mean, a lot of it is going. They've thought of this. They've figured this out already. All the things that you know, you, and it's a lot of a lot of it is sort of. Um, you know, stuff about tank destroyer doctrine and all that sort of um, stuff that people got very hung up on because, because after all, if you look at an M10, it's thin skinned, it's light, but it's got a great big cannon on it. And the idea is, the idea is you pop up, deal with the deal with the tiger or whatever, or the panther or the mark four, and then you and then you bugger off. Yeah. And it doesn't look. It's not as cool, is it, as uh, your sort of fortress tanks that the Germans have got. And he's 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 really good at all that stuff. So we're going to have him on. But you were saying last night that. He he turns up at stuff uninvited. <laughs> uh, well, no, he's. I feel really sorry for him because he, you know, he, he really, really knows his stuff. He's very yeah, clever. more than more than anybody. Yeah, more yeah. than anyone. Certainly more. He knows much more about World War Two tanks than any academic. Literally any yeah. academic on the planet. I would yeah. challenge any of them in a pitch battle yeah. with Nick Moran, and he would whip their ass. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely yeah. hands down. And yeah. and. He he never gets invited to uh, to speak at the National World War Two Museum conference, and I, I just don't really know why. And he, you know, he, I've seen him there several times, and I and, and I was going, why aren't you talking to him? He goes, oh well, you know, they didn't want me, and you know, I was kind of just, I was thinking, I just never, I don't understand. Well, if there's, he's if there's great, and he literally next- doesn't stop talking. He's he's a lovely bloke. Yeah. I really like him. He's and, yeah. and I got in touch with him on having seen you sent me the link yeah. and check this yeah. out. I then did check yeah. it out. I thought, wow, that is absolutely fantastic. So I then got in touch with him, and I've known him for years now. And we've done stuff yeah. together, filmed together, um, yeah. done all sorts of stuff. I've done stuff on World right. of Tanks for him, little chats about things. Um, yeah. Well, and, you know, we go back. Yeah, well, he's brilliant. He's brilliant. And uh, I mean, you know, if there were, if there's tall. a chalk next year, you should try and, get him, try and get him over, I'd say. Yeah, well, he has. He's been to chalk because he was com- He was doing something for World of Tanks at Bovington. So he said, look, I'm going to yeah, be here. Yeah. Do you want me to come over? I'm, yeah, damn right. Yeah. So he came and did, did yeah. some stuff. It was too late to put him in the formal programme. So he did one of those sort of stand-up ones by the tanks. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and he was well, brilliant. Anyway, but, but we should we're yeah, gonna, another year. We should, we should we're definitely have get him up when we have our own. If we ever get our yeah. own um, little festival thing away, yeah, yeah, then we should definitely get him. Yeah, there's he's, a, he's there magic. you go. There's a little there's a little breadcrumb for you. If we ever get our own festival, there's been there's been talk about doing something live. We're trying to fig, we're, we're trying to figure it out chit chat. If we're ever allowed out of our houses again by our governments, anyway. Right, a quick note for your diaries before we get started properly. Both films of our trip to the Spitfire Factory at Biggin Hill are up on the members' site. Um, uh, and there are uh, another couple of free audio books going up on the site this month. So lots of great content for you as the nights get darker and longer. Patreon.com slash We Have Ways for those. Um, uh, it's Molly Pantadown's uh, London Diaries and um, Chasmina, uh, which is read... Re- oh, gosh, what's her name? I've forgotten. Um, you'll find it on the site. And Chasmina is reading us um, Farley Mowat's um, And No Bird Shall Sing, which is... Uh, a, a classic of Canadian warfare. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's amazing. Way. It's yeah. amazing. But um, you and I, we're both reading good stuff at the moment, aren't we? Because you're... Yeah. We're, we're going through yes, this. Yes, well, this, you, this... well... Go on. Yeah. Well, it's... um, What's it called again? War Remind in the Shadows. Me. War in the Shadows. War in the Shadows. So, so uh, you recommended this to me yesterday um, during the live cast. And then on the Zoom after the live cast, I bought it and I started reading it. And it's a funny old book because it starts off with a sort of... Uh, uh, lots of appendices before the before the book starts so you've got a list of characters with their code names the code names how i'm using the code names what all, a glossary of terms and you're sort of thinking god just just get on with it for heaven's sake and it's about <clears throat> um it's about soe but it's not about soe it's also about it's sis about, it's about sis which is and it's mi6 about, which is mi6 and it's about what mi6 um uh 
it suggests in the book what MI6 did to SOE and that um uh, and what the, how they trod on SOE's operations and their interests and the stuff that SOE were, were, were getting away in France and you know stymied um, resistance efforts by de Gaullists. It, 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 but it starts off. I mean, I, I'm only. I, I mean, I was up late last night, or rather, I was up early this morning, and so I, I read a big chunk of it this morning. But it start. The, the really interesting thing is, it starts with an anonym, anonymous letter to an unlisted address. So whoever it was was able to find out where he lives. Where, In other words, he's got. You know, he's obviously from the he's intelligence spooky. firm. He's spooky. He's yeah. spooky. He's yeah. spooky. And it basically, and he gets this because he's already written a book about Jean Moulin. He's written this. He's already written a, ba- Who a book. Who is, you know, it. the great hero of the resistance. Yeah, he, he's the, the great guy, French martyred. resistance he, hero. He dies in early July, nineteen forty-three, having yep. been sprung by the Gestapo, of which Klaus yep. Barbie was the head of that particular unit in Lyon, in yeah, a yeah. suburb of Lyon called uh, called Calois. Calois. Yeah. Calois, Calois. Yeah. Calois. I think it is. Yeah. And it's the doctor's yeah. house, Doctor Du Goujon, and it's his house. And and some of the resistance leaders are there for a meeting to. To, to work out who's going to take over command of the secret army, which is commanded yep. by General Delestrand, but he's been arrested. And so they need a new head, and they're, they're discussing it. And Max, who is Jean Moulin, that's his code name, organises yep. this meeting there. And they get they get scuppered before they get even sprung. Started. They get sprung. Yeah. And it's yeah. who did it. And various finger-pointing has been going on ever since. Um, yep. There's a guy called René Hardy who had been captured by the Gestapo and released a few weeks earlier, and he was the prime suspect, but clearly wasn't involved. Then yep. there was Raymond Obrac, who was a communist and was a, communi- a leader of um, one of the communist part, uh, communist resistance groups, who was yep. very close to Jean Moulin, but but was also slippery as a fox as well. Uh, and yep. basically, he and his wife Lucy Obrac, who became these absolute legends of the resistance, and kind of basically only kind of one tear down from Jean Moulin, are basically serial liars uh, and absolutely yep. proved to be. Um, yep. And and the, none of their stories had any consistency, whatever. So the kind of finger, so 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 Patrick Marnham in his Jean Moulin biography kind of sort of slightly pointed the finger at Obrac. Yeah. And this yeah. this anonymous spook said, "Yeah, he was wily, he was slippery, but you're, you're barking up the wrong tree on that one." Yes, it's really interesting, and he uh, and he says. He, he says, uh, the, the letter's really funny because the letter sort of starts off, well, you know, I, was, I enjoyed your book and it was interesting to see a barrister write a book because you tend to ask better questions than historians ever would. Yeah. Um, but, but unfortunately, you just, did, you just failed to make the thing join up. And, you, you, you know, he sort of says in the letter, he kind of walked past some obvious clues and didn't, didn't follow things up the way you should have done yeah. because it was there right in front of you what's actually gone on. And it's just, I mean, absolutely fascinating that someone should... Someone should write him that letter, and then he and then he's staying in France and goes back to a house that he used to live in, and there's another package from that person. So he goes to see his old housekeeper, or whatever, for this house in France, and That's she goes, right. "Oh yeah, we we had this parcel, f- you know, for you. It's weird, and it's the same handwriting, the same smudged postmark, um, and uh, and there's a torn up letter in it, or torn up." sheet in it that he you know he pieces together that sort of continues the stuff he said and there's a couple of photographs and uh, some odd things in this package and so whoever this spooky person is knew one of his old addresses in France so like whoever it is is really you know is really needs him to know as well that's what's really interesting and he's doing it on this sort of back channel and he says normally a letter like that you toss in the bin but there was just a some of the language some of the turns of phrase, he thinks this is, you know, is it someone Scottish? What's going on here? What but, what actually is this? But there's also so, the, it's a fascinating. But book. also the the head of the SD in Paris, or the second deputy head of the SD, is a chap called Bermelberg. Yeah, uh, yeah. and and um, and it's clear that this spook knew him. Yep. Before the war or after, because I think he was an intelligence. He was a policeman at Interpol before the yeah. war in Paris. Yeah. This SS guy. Yeah. This SD yeah, yeah. guy, and so. And he was he was vehemently anti-communist rather than massively pro-Nazi. But you know, weren't they all? But I mean, you know, six but, of but, one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but you know, so so. But he was known, and, and it's just oh my god, and, and it it just gets better and better. I mean, the 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 thing that's so fascinating is his excoriation of, of M R D Foot, who is the official historian, yeah, yeah. who then wrote his own yeah. separate book. And he yeah. just says that a lot of the stuff he's put in there is just absolute nonsense. And he goes through it bit by bit, saying why, 
you know, deconstructing Foot's arguments, and and clearly yeah. what he's doing is is Foot is doing is, is is putting over. Okay, after the war, they've all decided. Okay, this is because because SOE then gets taken over, it gets disbanded in early nineteen forty six, yeah. and yeah, everything yeah. about it then gets absorbed into MI six. Yeah. So, th- the official history of SOE in France, which comes out it's in nineteen sixty six or whatever, is written yeah. by a former spook under the kind of instructions of his superiors at MI six. Yes. So, in other words, it's a cock um, and bull. It's 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 probably a load of nonsense. Yeah. Uh, because after all, MI six MI six has its secrets to protect and yeah. the deals it did. Because because uh, and of course, this is a Cold War artifact. This history of this history of um, uh, SOE written in nineteen sixty two. It's not about it's not about the war, is it? It's about yeah. um, it's about the Cold War. It's written for right. Cold War digestion because after of all, there's course. loads of communists and. And people that you need to, you know, what, what we did about the communists at the time is a sort of cold, a thing for Cold War digestion as much as anything else. And, uh, and of course, MI6 by that point, as we know, is so like crazily anti-communist that it's part, arguably a little bit pro-fascist, right? Um, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you know what I mean? So, so that's what you're going to get from a history written in 1962. So having that distance. And obviously, whoever this wrote this anonymous letter thought, you know, this, what happened here... People need to know about it. It's a it's a tra- it's a travesty. Um, well, at some point when you fi- when you finished it, um, yeah, yeah, uh, when I've chugged through it, we, yeah. we should get Patrick on because I've I've got yeah. so many questions I want to ask him. Is I, he I, terribly ain't? He's terribly ancient, though, isn't he? Because the only thing he was a young boy in 1962. Like in yeah, he's sort of twenty in 1962, isn't he? So, all right, yeah, but we're be quite yeah. ancient. Yeah, so we need to so we need to crack on with that. <laughs> But I'm sure he's fine. I'm sure he's fine. No, but I think we should get him on. And it's um, uh, 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 because after because because um, I read that novel last year, A Treachery of Spies, which is oh, a yes, sort of which is a sort of yeah, it's great fun, like an SOE thing. But she touches on the fact that you have the different the different uh, um, allied agencies, you know, or all, all uh, and OSS. You know, they're all they're all um, bashing alongside each other, and very often not paying attention to what the other side what the other agency is doing or not telling them um i mean there's as much of that as there is of anything else isn't there they're just they're not letting the other uh, you know soe don't aren't being told by sis what they're doing the oss aren't telling either of them yeah um uh, and that and that so you get overlaps you get contradictions you get you know uh yeah. people accidentally blowing other people and all that sort of thing but the other thing i think that's really really clear from from um sabotage and secret intelligence work in the second world war is that everyone was utterly, utterly ruthless, uh, not least yeah. the British. I mean, the British were yeah. completely ruthless on this. And, and the fact that we're yeah. this sort of, you know, nice picture box place with kind of, you know, red telephone boxes and, and fields and yeah. warm ale and cricket and yeah. all the rest of it, you know, yeah. don't be fooled by that. I mean, it, time yeah. and time again, the British government and, the, and the, you know, the chiefs of staff and the Allies, they absolutely shaft resistance whether they be yeah. in the Balkans whether they be in Italy whether they be in yeah. France and a, and a classic example of that is is around you know is in in Normandy where they tell everyone that get ready for the bigger uh, you know uh, insurrection everyone needs to rise up uh, we're going to send you lots and lots of arms and it's all going to be cool and then they're they very don't. careful about who they send arms to and who they don't and lots of yeah. there's lots of maquis lots of resistance groups who get absolutely nothing so they're all yeah. g'd up they're ready to go and as a result of that half of them get slaughtered because yeah. they rise up expecting, you know, the next day to have a drop and it never appears. And so then they're kind yeah. of expose themselves and they're absolutely screwed. Um, yeah. and, and all this is about about controlling that how much the resistance comes into play. So what they do want them to do is sabotage operations. What they don't want to do is have lots of commies careering around, around yeah. Europe um, firing Bren guns and Sten guns. So yeah. it's about controlling that. And it's, and it's really interesting that in northern Italy, for example... Publicly, after the war yeah. and at the time, they're saying to resistance groups, "We are sending you twenty-five, yeah. you know, um, parachute drops of cases of machine guns and boots and ammunition and grenades." And actually, they're sending one. Yeah, yeah, they just don't do it. Yeah. They just yeah, don't yeah, do yeah, it, or yeah. they completely lie about the numbers. Yeah, uh, and yeah. Th- th- there's a huge discrepancy because you can look at the national archives; you can find um, the logs of these um, these squadrons that are doing the drops. And there's just, there's just absolutely no marriage of the two at all. 
It's complete, yeah. You know what they yeah. what they're actually dropping, what they say they're dropping, is two completely different things. One's total yeah. fiction, and one's reality, uh, and that's why all those Italian partisans in the winter of forty four, forty five yeah. got absolutely Come shafted yeah. because they're just yeah, abandoned. Yeah. Uh, it, but then, but then, I suppose if you're, you know, we go back to the anti communism thing of the of before the war yeah. is that the, you know uh, uh, after all one of the one of the things that sort of um, informs appeasement. And people don't like to talk about this because appeasement is often seen as, uh, you know, oh, it's, dirty it's word. because we don't another. It, well, a, it's a dirty word. And B, it's we don't want another war full stop. A, a, a mm. big part of the sort of thing that, that, that makes appeasement palatable is people think that Hitler is the answer to communism, Bolshevism, yeah. to communism. And that actually that's preferable or or at least it's not Bolshevism, at least it's not communism. And so there's and there's a large chunk of perfectly sensible, intelligent, well, maybe they're not sensible, perfectly intelligent people and high up people it, throughout the British establishment who think that. So little wonder that that might then feed into, well, at least we got rid of the Nazis, but what, what, well, let's take an opportunity to get rid of the communists as well yeah. while, we're at, while we're at it. And there's no doubt. And then that, that obviously plugs into the Cold War thing in the 60s when when that's what you're doing is is uh, fighting communism yeah. so little wonder you cover up the thing where you where you betrayed the french resistance who were yeah. you know on your side and not communist because that's because moulin after all was a gaullist you know and, and it's a it's a it's a part of the gaullist picture isn't it i mean it's it's fascinating yeah. i will finish the book though james yeah yeah <laughs> I, I i think it is I, I think it is really really interesting and the other thing i think is really interesting is that there were more sis stroke mi6 agency in france and there were soe you know i think you know yeah. it's, it's so soe dominated our understanding you know if you ever make a write a novel or or make a film about about you know resisting types in in france it's always it's SOE, SOE, it? always every single time yes, but and, isn't you know, but isn't that because soe you know that you can read the directive from churchill saying i want this to happen set europe ablaze you set that. it up it's full of amateurs it's full of journalists you know um and, and, and all that stuff and so you can you can tell a story of it forming the training is pretty well documented you've got you've got proper heroic heroic people go you know going going through it and dying and all that sort of thing whereas mi6 previously exists yeah it's it is shadowy it's shadowy now so um you know it, it, it it's it's not as sort of heartwarming a story and, and again we come back to this we come back to this way of looking at the war. What's more important, the, the, the story that we like to tell about ourselves, and SOE is a story we like to tell about ourselves, like the few, yeah. or do we tell the, or do we talk about what actually happened? Yeah, the sort of <laughs> SIS shits and kind of dark. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I mean, well, but, or, but, may, or you know, SIS people making hard-boiled decisions about communists that that that. You know that maybe that maybe <clears throat> were the right decisions. That's the other. That's the other terrible thing is maybe they maybe that was the right thing to do, because if you'd had such a because maybe actually you need to keep it unstable until the invasion, and then you pick a side. And if you have a side push through before the invasion, it can destabilize your po- you know what you do post invasion. So keeping De Gaulle on the back foot before Overlord is is probably. Yes. What the outcome you're after? If he's too sort of, you, you know, if, I'm starting to think about the, you know what the thinking must have been. If De Gaulle's too sort of entrenched, you know, you don't have an option after the invasion in case De Gaulle turns out to be unpopular with a large chunk of the population. Do you, you see what I mean? Yeah, but it seems to me that the the the, the frosty argument is that all the concerns about MI6 from MI6 point of view and from the British government's point of yeah. view is that Jean Moulin has done the job too well. The, yeah, exactly. the, the, the unifying of, of all these different shards and strands. You no, know, so you've got yeah. um, Henri Frenet's, um, I think it's Combat, he's Combat, isn't he? Which is a right wing yeah. organisation. You've got Raymond O'Brien yeah. with, the, with the commies and, and you yeah. know, the Frank Tireurs and, and all the rest of it. And um, they've gelled too, too well. So suddenly you've yeah. got this homogenous whole, and, yeah. and, and, the, and the Allies back in London are losing control of that because they're too yeah, organised. Yeah, yeah. So you yeah. want to disorganise them and put them into regions yeah. where you, back in London, can control them. And, and yeah, what yeah. you don't want is De Gaulle galloping away as figurehead yeah. because yeah. you don't want you don't actually what you don't want him to do is set up a kind of post-war fascist dictatorship either. So no. so that's another no. threat. 
So, so yeah. actually, maybe you just got to kind of splinter all that, and then you regain the control yourself back from London. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and with your rules and your terms, rather than yeah. with sort of pesky Frenchmen. So it so it's 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 Whitehall real politique, basically. Right. Um, but 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 yeah. but at the same time, there does seem to be quite a lot of ineptitude from SOE. I mean, sending yeah. Nor Inyet Khan, who is incredibly yeah. beautiful and, and of yeah. Indian descent, into yeah. France when when her French is not perfect. You just kind of, you know, it's like breaking all the rules well, because the last thing you she, want is a very beautiful agent going into France. Well, she also, p- part of how she got rumbled is she misunderstood, because lots of journalists um, worked in SOE and they talked about you've got to do your copy. And what journalists mean by copy is just what you write down. She thought you were meant to copy it all down. She misunderstood. Right. Yeah. And so that's, they found her stuff on her, her yeah. messages on her, because she'd copied her messages down because she thought right. copy meant copy right not co- not copy but she if was you, already stuff I mean. because but, she was part of that yeah i know but, but but the sort of amateurism the amateurism yeah. at the heart of that 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 you know because after all you, i mean the story of soe you know all that stuff about people training in scotland and you know there's that amazing story that's supposedly these two lithuanians they recruit mm. who go to test their unarmed combat in glasgow and to kill two people in a pub they start a fight in start a fight in a pub in a dockyard pub in Glasgow. Laugh, but... kill, kill kill two people to see if to see if the unarmed combat works. Yeah. I mean, you know, they're subst- and they're, they're then hustled off. Apparently, I mean that go to, you know, part go, of, go to France. The, exactly the mythology of it all. And you're absolutely right. What are you doing, sending someone so conspicuous? Yeah, um, exactly. Regardless it, of, of her kind of, uh, you know, and, and the fact that she does not understand what copy means. I mean, you know, jeepers. Yeah. I mean, well, and that just shows that what a rotten job they've done of training her as well, yeah, completely. actually. That's my point. Um, uh, uh, um, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it, 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 I, uh, yeah. I mean, the, uh, we're gonna we're gonna need to take a break. And the other book I was reading was that <laughs> that occult, the occult book, the hit, uh, the Hitler and the occult, which, oh, yes. um, in a nutshell, overstated its case. Um, we're gonna... <laughs> uh, an elastic definition of occult was required to make that book stand up. Anyway, we'll, we'll see you in a tick. You're listening to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. Hello, it's James Holland here. And on the very odd chance you've missed it, I've got a new book out, Sicily 43, about the epic 38-day battle that raged in July and August 1943. It's a story that involves breathtaking action at sea, in the air and on land. Its conquest involved airborne operations, daring raids by special forces, the harnessing of the mafia, attacks across mosquito-infested plains, assaults up almost sheer faces of rock and scrub, and featured an astonishing array of highly colourful characters, and all to a backdrop of relentless heat, dust, mosquitoes and truly brutal terrain. There's a special edition with extra content at waterstones.com, but you can also get it at Amazon, an array of supermarkets, or any of those wonderful independents that are dotted around the country. Thank you for listening, and grazie mille. Hi, I'm Tom Holland, here to tell you about a brand new podcast called The Rest is History with Tom and Dom. So basically, Dominic, what I'm saying is that the, the idea of greatness is comes from ancient history. Yeah. And, yes. but, but you, of course, you're, you're a modern historian. So, uh, I mean, basically, you don't have great people. No, not really. Apathy is so underrated. Yes. Because the more, you know, if you ever want to find yes. somewhere where everyone cares about politics, they're talking about politics, yeah. that place is Spain, 1934. Yes. You, know, you don't, yes. want, to, you don't happy, want to be there. The, happy the land that takes no interest in politics. Right, exactly. In, in the English Civil War, I was identified with the club men. Oh, yeah. were, they, they, uh, from, they were people who basically didn't want to fight on either side. So they fight both. So they, they, they would get clubs, hence their name, um, and they would uh, go and retreat and live in a forest. <laughs> so, <laughs> whereas if you behave like Frederick the Great, you're going you to end up, you're, you're going to end up in a bunker in, in uh, Berlin well, being true. attacked that's by the Soviets. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I think that, that's not the fate I want for myself. <laughs> The rest is history with Tom, that's me, and Dom, my sparring partner, Dominic Sandbrook, distilling the entirety of human history, or at least as much of it as we can fit, into about half an hour a week. Subscribe now. Available wherever you get your podcasts.
Uh, welcome back. Um, uh, Whoa, well, 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 that, well, that, was, a, that was that a little rabbit hole, didn't it? That was like the old days. Yeah, um, should we perfect. answer some uh, some questions? We some tweets and emails to get through. Um, Stephen Rushton DM'd us on Twitter. He said, I listened with interest when you mentioned the work of the Y services a few weeks back. I no. served in the Royal Signals in the 80s and 90s in a signal intelligence role at units that are descended from the wartime y, y services. How cool well, is that? Very cool. Whenever SIGINT is mentioned, whenever wartime SIGINT is mentioned, it's usually in relation to the work done at Bletchley Park. Yet, as James said, there were Y service units serving all around the globe supporting the war effort. So my question, were there any battles or operations where SIGINT, potentially on any side, played an important or decisive role. Well, yes. Um, the bulge, the Germans simply stop talking to each other on radio in the uh, fortnight running up to the bulge. And so there's no SIGINT. There's nothing for the Y service to listen to. And uh, the Allies, rather than thinking, oh, that's fishy, <laughs> think, oh, well, there's nothing going on there. So um, the, the, the surprise it's achieved sort of the bulge. good reason, but yeah. And for yeah, those yeah, who yeah, don't yeah. know, SIGINT stands for Signals Intelligence. Sig- as opposed to HUMINT, which is Human Intelligence, which is sort of what we were talking about a little bit in the in the first part. Yeah. But basically, you know, that's people that's people photocopying documents or stuffing stuffing uh, uh, tank production figures in their trousers and and handing them over. And and also, yeah, I, th- I think uh, you know, to a certain extent, though, you can't really separate SIGINT from from human. what is doing it, what what is happening at Bletchley. And the, and the point I've been trying to make. Over you know whenever it comes up is is that it's you've got to see it as a whole you you can't separate yeah. one from the other and what's what yeah. what the Y service is doing is listening to coded radio messages yeah. and uncoded radio messages yeah, yeah. and just Listen radio everything so so they're listening yeah. to the news in Germany to yeah. find out what the Germans are saying about what's happening they're listening yeah, yeah. to all sorts of signals messages so there's a whole host of different. But stuff in, that the Y service is listening. And then they, but you know, Curtis stuff is then passed on to Bletchley, obviously. Yeah, but intelligence is sort of like one of those pointer list paintings, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's all the dot. It's all the dots. When you come out, you see the you see the, the image. But if you go in, all you're seeing is the dots. Yeah, and that's it's, a really it's, good analogy, actually. It's finding the, it's getting the picture out of the, uh, uh, not joining the dots. It's not like that. It's like a pointer list picture. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, but, but, but Sigin, Sigin, you know, because, the, because Ble- Bletchley, after all, Bletchley has become so glamorous and become so sort of um, at the forefront of people's imagining, imagination about the Second World War. Because, again, it's it's a lovely story to tell about ourselves how, you know, um, our Brit- British boffins invent the computer and save the world. I mean, uh, uh, what, yeah. what's not to like? It's certainly more interesting than, you know, Canadian squaddy up to his neck in mud in, in, uh, Holland, yeah. in Holland in the Scheldt, you know, uh, uh, um Almost drowns, blah blah blah. You know, it's 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 sexier. Um, but let me let me give you uh, one example of, of how the Y service. So the Y service picks up that the Germans are building a massive bunker, but uh, on on is it the the Vevel, um near Bremen, yeah. just north of Bremen, on the on the river there. Was it the Weser yeah. or whatever it is? Whatever that river is, yeah, that yeah. goes up to Bremen, yeah, yeah. Bremenhaven. And yeah. um, so so the Y service picks up this information. So they right. then send over. PR Spitfires, yeah. Who then photograph it, and they go, "Oh yep. yeah, okay." It's a massive bunker being made here, about four hundred meters long, one hundred meters wide, and yep. they regularly fly over it. Yeah. And they work out that the and they, and they also observe how they're they're constructing the roof, and they discover that one's got is fifteen meters thick, and one is part of the roof is five meters thick. Yeah. And about a month before it's completed, or three weeks before it's completed, they send over 617 Squadron with, with put an earthquake bomb in it. And put yeah. an earthquake bomb in it and destroy it. <laughs> yeah. And that's that's yeah. how that works. And so you've got you've got the Y service is playing a is playing a key part in that whole operation because it's got got it all off in the first place. Yeah. But it is the it is the photographic people from RF Medmanham who are doing the kind of the who are then taking that on. And then obviously yeah. it's an active squadron that's then delivering the the fatal blow. They 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 um detonated a tall boy the other day, didn't they? Where was it? In Poland or somewhere? Was that so? I missed that completely. Yeah yeah yeah. Wow. They, an unexpl- they found an unexploded tall boy and wow. um uh, uh, uh and and blew it up. I think, I think or was it in? I think it was. It may even have been in Germany. Right. Maybe maybe it was a stray one from that raid. I can't remember. Yeah. It, it made the news briefly. And it was that you know that that they they find it and you're like. Oh, 
Christ. Yeah. I mean, you don't you don't want to find one of those at the bottom of your garden, do you? No, you but really don't. The fin the fins of one of those sticking out. <laughs> sticking out at an angle. Of your compost <laughs> patch. Yeah. You've been sort of growing your training your roses round it. <laughs> oh, <magic>. Christ. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so they were called earthquake um, bombs for a reason. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, <laughs> now, um, Victoria Adams got in touch on Twitter. She said, love the pod. A question. In David Edgerton's Britain's War Machine, he suggests that the British Empire could have won without the US direct intervention, but still economic support if the Japanese war had not occurred, relying heavily on the Indian Army and Dominions. What do you think? Well, um, I think you're looking at a 15-year Napoleonic-style conflict... But yes, actually, mm, I, um, I would say it exactly have, the same. I, 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 you'd have you'd have ended up with an extremely different, uh, again, an extremely different post-imperial settlement at the end of it. Mm. Um, uh, after all, because because you know one of the one of the one of the you know direct consequences of 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 the end of the of the Second World War is that the British have to completely with redraw the the empire and what it how it works and all that. And I think if you'd been if you had relied heavily on the Indian Army and the Dominions, you know you'd have you'd have looked you'd have been looking at a very very different post imperial um, Europe and world. But I don't know. I think it's possible. But it would just have taken so much longer. Um, yeah, and there's lots of evidence through history for wars taking a hell of a long time. I mean, the Napoleonic Wars, best part of twenty years. Um, you've got yep. seven years war. You've got um, thirty. Got the 30, thirty years, years war, war. You know. Um, you know, actually, I mean, I think what's, what's interesting about, about the Second World War, when you consider the totality of effort from the combatant nations, you know, the fact that it's all yeah. over in kind of five and a half is pretty... Yes, well, it's... Best part it's, of six is, is, pretty, is pretty impressive. Well, it's also really, that's quite pretty quick. extraordinary. You know, 14 yeah. years in Afghanistan didn't really achieve a huge amount. Um, you know, it, it can take a hell of a long time. Um, yeah. Uh, and what is i think you're absolutely right out to be honest i can I, I would i would completely concur with that i mean you certainly wouldn't have had a, a, a cross channel invasion in 1944 but what you would no. have had is plenty of destroyed cities because vast of the, most of the cities that are destroyed in germany are destroyed by the bomber command um, yeah. and i think what you do is you just build up more and more force more air forces there'd just be more bombers going over um, well, and, because and, you wouldn't have you, such need for such big armies at that stage. Well, so. and maybe a, a British atomic bomb in 1949 tested in Australia and dropped on and dropped on Berlin in 1950. I mean, of course, it de- it it depends what the Soviet Union, where the Soviet Union end up in this in this picture. Um, uh, that if you don't have the Japanese war, you know, if if the Soviets are fighting fighting the um, uh, uh, the, the Germans and and you get a similar outcome where they aren't defeated mm. um, in the first sort of phase of that, then I expect you're, you know, you're, you're looking at, you're still looking at something a, a lot longer, but, but nevertheless possible. Although, of course, probably with Britain even more bankrupt yes. <laughs> than, than, than it was in 1945. Yeah. You know, and, and more reliant maybe on American aid if it had just been reliant, reliant on American economic support rather than American military support. Because after all, you know, the Americans coming to the war means that we're not having to buy everything off them to prosecute the war. They're doing some of that themselves. So, But, but also, so, they're, you know, they're, you know, they're, you know how, how Roosevelt gets the, um, the go-ahead from, um, from, from Congress to, to, to raise all that money and spend all that, those, those billions on, on rearming... Yeah. Is on the basis that we'll get other people to do it for us, so that our young men yeah. don't have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, you know, because after all, well, what's not to like? I mean, you know. Well, because uh, because because after all, the model in the model in you know proto global conflict from the from the you know Seven Years War, World War Zero, as some people like to call it, that you, you get coalition warfare, and the British tend to do the thing where they run the oceans, they field a small army, and they get, and then they pay they pay their allies. Or help their allies to pay for their armies to fight. You know, Marlborough's doing that mm-hmm. um, uh, 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 b- b- before the Seven Years' War, even. And then the Seven Years' War, the Napoleonic Wars. I mean, you only have to look at you only have to look at the composition of, of Wellington's army in in 1815 at Waterloo to see that that's exactly what the British yep. are doing. Half and the British are able to. And the, yeah, exactly. You know, the King's hiring, German Legion and all that. Exactly, hiring hiring the Prussians. The you know because uh, uh, because it, it's not just Prussians who are, are fighting for Blucher. It's it's you know half of the, the guys fighting in Scarlet at Waterloo yeah. are, are German. Yeah, but yeah, half, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, you know proportion. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. People from Nassau and all all over. Mm-hmm. And you know, because after all, you know, the British throne at that point is 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 entirely German. keyed into German alliances because it's because it's German because they were the only palatable people available to the royal family at the British political establishment at the time. And I think so. So yeah, absolutely. If you look at the Second World War in that tradition of like of a uh, uh, which of course we don't because we've got this a historical an- anachronistic idea of us on our own doing it all by ourselves it was in fact the british state go all oh, right okay well you know obviously the navy the, the battle of the atlantic is going to be more difficult because of submarine warfare but that's the that's the only thing that's different f- in terms of how we prosecute that you know it's entirely like it's entirely like smashing Villeneuve at Trafalgar and then the French Navy can't interfere with any of your operations after that. You know, right. it's, it's the same thing. It's the same principle, isn't it? Exactly the same principle. Yeah, and also that, that thing... And that's of, the whole point of, of, of making, of hurrying up and winning the Battle of the Atlantic in yeah. in the early part of 1943. Because if yeah. you don't do that, you can't plan properly because you don't yeah, know yeah. how much shipping you've got coming. You, yeah, yeah. You know, if, yeah. if you know that 98% of your shipping is going to come across the Atlantic, then that's fine. You know, you can, you can yeah. plan Sicily and... Italy yeah. and Normandy. Yeah, well, because of these sort of three three, three quarter year turnarounds in getting Absolutely. stuff in and out, and and also because if you're if you're sending convoys in when they arrive in harbour, they have to queue, whereas normally a harbour just has whatever's coming and going. Yeah, at talking the time of which, and... it does annoy me this whole thing about about. I, I mean, you know, I completely. I, I think it's a really good idea that people that the National Trust is kind of working out what you know which big houses benefited from the slave trade. Yeah. But singling yeah. out Chartwell because of Churchill's involvement in the Bengal famine, I think he's just completely wrong. I, I really, really do. You know, it's 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 betraying a lack of understanding of how that that operate and laying the blame at him is is absurd. You know, it's just more complicated than that. It's more complicated than that. But but then but then, you know what you've got there. I think is it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because we, we, in the first half we talked about which story would you rather tell about yourself, um, uh, uh, about the the few or about any other aspect of the war. And now the story we're telling about ourselves is we we all know what a rotter Churchill actually was. Yeah, I just think, I just think that's. A, Do you, I, I know, know, which I think is similar is similar is similarly it's like a reverse um, version of it. Exactly, but it's it's similarly daft. It's similarly um, uh, um, uh, ahistoric. Yes, is the is, is yes. the is the is the problem. But, anyway, but, so, but it yeah. annoys me that they've just sort of gone. They've gone for this sort of consensus kind of, you know, social media view of it without actually. Mm. You know, why haven't they? If if they're going to say something like that, why haven't they actually got a proper historian to look into it properly and kind of contextualize it? Because that um, they might have to pay someone. <laughs> Maybe I'll write them a letter. Yeah, write them a letter. Um, uh, um, how long have we been? How long have we been? Oh God, we've been minutes. chuntering on forever. Um, let's uh, let's take this uh, one from Kansas City because we're Ooh. we're, we're going because yeah, we like Americans. Like we like Americans. Um, from Gene in Kansas City, and that's the right name if you're from Kansas City. Congratulations, Gene, a, a, a longish time listener, first time caller. I've binged most of the episodes over the last two weeks, and it has been. Um, a joy, but I'm shocked and dismayed that I've yet to hear an episode where the glorious chindits are even mentioned. I have every confidence <laughs> you gents will labour to rectify this oversight. oversight. <clears throat> Thanks, love the show. Um, uh, well, we I think we haven't talked about the chindits um, because you're more interested in the actual main set piece things that the 14th Army do and achieve. So yeah, uh, no, I'm, the, I, and, yes, but. but I mean, the, the Chindits are really interesting. Uh, and, and actually, my village GP when I grew up was called Dr. Chris Brown. And he yeah. was in the RAMC and he was on the second Chindit expedition. Yeah. And he kept yeah. a very, very detailed diary. And, yeah. and he also kept all his uniform and he kept his silk escape maps and all that kind of stuff. It's was he a medic amazing. on that? Was he a medic on that? He approach? was a medic on that. Uh, and, and oh, you know, blimey. they were all God, dropping been, like flies. They all got yellow busy. fever. Yeah. They all got yellow fever. They all and they all got hepatitis, um, yeah. and they're all dropping like flies. And it was absolutely abundantly clear. Um, and they ended up they did so they 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 had to march something like hundred miles to start off with before they were in any position to kind of take on the on the Japanese. Yeah. And when they did take on the Japanese, they actually did quite well. Uh, and they saw off whatever attacks you know they yeah. they kind of sort of dealt them a bloody nose and blew up some dumps and all that kind of yeah. stuff. Um, 
But hardly any of them are in any fit state to fight, let alone walk yeah. another ten miles. Uh, and that was sort of part of the problem. And I think I think the real the, the, there's two issues with the Chindit. The, the Chindit expeditions, the idea of operating behind enemy lines in an asymmetric way, was clearly the right kind of thinking for Burma, yeah. where asymmetric yeah. warfare is king. But it's just that the resources that were put to it. But you can't do it. On, you can't do. You can't do that. On a divisional level, though, it, it, it quite because it, that's the problem. It's just too big. It's just too big. Well, it was too and, big and first time around. There was about three thousand men in in the spring of nineteen forty three. But small, self sufficient outfits, you know, doing guerrilla yes. with guerrilla raids. And it, I mean, it's interesting because obviously, since the, in the development of special forces, it's all got smaller, 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 and small has become beautiful in in in, in, in that respect, does not it? And but but you can't but you can't you can't insert a division and expect it expect it to to wash its face. It's it's sort of it's too big. It's too it's it's too difficult. And of course, a massive diversion. If 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 you what you're doing at this point is using air supply. If you're if you're building these these redoubts to fight the Japanese and you're air supplying them, that supplying sort of these wandering wandering guys in the yep. middle of nowhere is 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 a dilution of your of your uh, main effort. I mean, I think it's also, I mean, it's, it, uh, it is also one of these things where undeniably there's glamour around the Chindits that some bloke in the Somerset in the, in a, in a normal unit for, or whatever, fighting in the admin box or wherever, doesn't get the, doesn't get the sort of um, uh, kudos, does he? Whereas it's just as difficult fighting in the jungle wherever you are, yeah. whether you're Chinditing it or whether you're, you know, it's just as unpleasant. It's really interesting, though, because, you know, it's like 3,000 men is still is a huge number, even in the spring of 1953. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and somehow, Ord Wingate, with this kind of sort of single-minded sort of passion and kind of sort of messianic kind of I am right, yeah. manages yeah. to get a passage to the Quebec conference and kind of win everyone over. And, of course, Churchill yeah. loves anything that's kind of sort of wacky and off beast yeah. and kind of setting you up blazer yeah. and glamorous and all the rest of it. So he completely falls on it and goes, no, we've got, to, we've got to support this. We've got to make this happen. You know, because because Wingate is a very very charismatic person who can sort of win anyone over to his argument. Yeah, but but it's worth thinking about about the second um, Chindit operation. You know, it's like twelve thousand men, I know. you know, and, and most of whom are fighting men. So that's the yeah. best part of Seventieth Division. Yeah. Plus, they have to create kind of four airstrips to make it happen. You know, carved out of the jungle. Yeah. I mean, it's insane. Uh, and I mean, the, you know, to and, be you honest, to, what, and then context textualize when this is happening. So this is happening yeah. immediately after the admin box and at the beginning yeah. of the battle for Imphal, which is a kind of life yeah. or death kind of you know the yeah. biggest most important struggle. Yeah, you just need it like a bolt on the head. And the other thing yeah. that's really interesting is the only reason that that Renya Mutaguchi, um thinks he can get all the way up to Dimapur and break into into um, Assam and get across the Brahmaputra is because of what he's seen the Chindits doing the previous year. Right. So he goes, well, hang that- on a minute, if those those British bastards can actually yeah, can get do across, that, then, we, go, 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 then yeah. we can do it and we can do it even bigger. Oh, well, in which case, in which case that first Chindit operation is entirely worth it. <laughs> it draws the Japanese into making a terrible error. Well, um, yes. <laughs> I mean, the other. I mean, basically, basically, what they need is helicopters, and helicopters don't exist at this point because because the thing about an airstrip is airstrips are vast, aren't they? And yep. you can't take them with you. Whereas ha- hacking a gap in the jungle big enough to land a helicopter, which is what they end up doing, the SAS end up doing in Malaya very very effectively in the Malayan emergency, where they would they could. They could insert themselves in, you know, contained amounts and do pretty well in the jungle doing that. Um, you know, the, basically, the thing Wingate doesn't have is the helicopter. He's not going to get it. And until you've got the helicopter, it's not really, none of this is really possible. And even then, I mean, imagine trying to shift the division in helicopters. It's just, it's, yeah. it's bonkers. And they're trying to reuse gliders and all this sort of thing. Um, however, um, Gene then adds, and I really like Gene's, Gene has a PS. The American flyers supporting the Chindits is a shining example of US and British forces working directly together to great effect. The topic of Anglo-American rivalry surfaces on the show a lot, but we see that these rifts are the exception and the Anglo-American alliance was probably the greatest military alliance in human history. Can you guys provide more tactical examples of the special relationship working so swimmingly? Yes. Yes, the war. <laughs> Countless. The whole thing. I mean, just, Normandy. Just, um, well, you just think of, well, you think of D-Day itself, of all those um, landing craft that, that drop a load of people, Royal Navy run, or with sappers on all sort of thing, who drop a load of people on 
on uh, the British beaches and then they're recycled and they're, they're, they're going around dropping people on Omaha and stuff. You know, th- yeah. there's this, th- you know, because that's just how we're going to do it. And there's yeah. no, there's no like, our oh, boys have got to be in American boats. Or anything. That's not, that's just not happening. Yeah, because it's, I, I, I totally because, agree with Gene. And, and I remember yeah. standing up at, at some lardy da shindig um, uh, on the 75th anniversary of Normandy in Normandy last year with a whole load of American yep. senators and veterans yep. and the great and the good and all the rest of it. And I, I said to him, uh, I said to them that, that, that Operation Overlord and, and the Normandy campaign and, and what they achieved in the Second World War was the greatest act of coalition, cooperation and coordination ever in the history of the world between two nations. Yeah. Well, well it is. That. It absolutely is. It is. And, and I well, totally agree. Everyone's so obsessed with the kind of the discord when actually they should be focusing on the incredible accord. And, and, well, and when there are only coalition partners, not a formal alliance as well. It's, it's well, an awful, but also an awful lot of the discord is is written about post-war when people have, let's be honest, books to sell, um, um, grudges, yeah. to, grudges, scores to settle, all this sort of thing. I mean, the, 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 the other thing is, I mean, often, often one of these things that's worth saying is well compared to what you know um uh, you know when we talk about oh the allies are too slow in normandy well compared to what so if we compare it to the, the germans the germans never do a thing like the normandy landing so you can't you can't compare their performance yeah. to anything else but look at how the germans keep treat their coalition partners <laughs> they're alliance <laughs> they're allies they're, they're, allies. Fact, they're allies. allies aren't they they're not even they're formal allies for you know they treat the, they treat the italians like shit um really totally. really poorly Right from the off, yeah. Um, uh, they treat the, the, you know, the, the way they treat um, the Romanians and the, the, uh, you know, just everyone else. Everyone, just everyone. You know, uh, it, they're it, contemptuous. It's, they snook down their noses. They're sneering. They they treat exactly. them with, with they with betray them contempt. They betray them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then and then the Japanese who could actually be useful to them. They basically just don't know what to do. They don't put any serious thought into it at all. No. You know, breaking a tiger d- tank down in parts and setting it by U-boat isn't anyone doing, isn't any, isn't joined no, up. because the Japanese by, have got no, we- they haven't got the wherewithal to make yeah, them anyway. Exactly. Exactly. It's just, Bonkers. it's just, yeah. So, so if you want to, you know, when people go, oh, you know, there was some friction at Shafe about this, that, the other. Well, first of all, they're all sat in a room together debating this stuff and arguing out collegiately in that style, in a way that, doesn't exist in in OKW, you know, the, or OKH. I mean, let, the simple fact that there's OKW and OKH demonstrates how screwed the German command system is. There isn't a, there isn't, there aren't single committees that do everything. And the way the Germans treat their allies. I mean, I, I think that that's a really good point from Gene, a, a, an excellent point. Yeah. And that that that's that. Yeah. It's why they win. Yeah. It's why they win in the in the record time they do. It's it's it's, it's Yes, it's, it's why that, it's only 6 years. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, it, yes, but if you think it is kind of, you know, actually it's from the moment that the American troops start arriving in Britain, it's certainly in the war in yeah. the west. It's 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 no time at all. It's like 3 years. Yeah. And yeah. and it's it's brilliant how quickly those lessons are learned and how quickly they work together. Uh, and work yeah. together very well. And you see time and time again, you see there are definitely spats on on national lines because there are slightly different approaches to strategy and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and there are, of course, there are repeatedly there are personality clashes, but but there is no consensus that that, that there is no pattern that says those personality clashes are drawn up on national lines. It is just no. personality clashes because you yeah, equally yeah, yeah. get. I mean, you know, Tedder and Spots are absolutely as one in hating Monty. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, um, um, Tedder obviously is British and Spots is a, is American. I mean, you know, but that's and, and ditto but that you can, you know. But you can just you could if you want you can simply cut that as that's Army Air Force, you know. Pete right, Casada the, the, and Mary Cunningham are really tight. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. it's, and it's every, just, well, and everyone and each of the each of the service wings has convinced themselves that they can win the war without necessarily any help from the other. You know, the, the yeah. air forces are convinced they can win the war because because it looks like they are. You yeah. know, if, you, if well, you're they doing done by like, any normal standard of warfare. Yeah. Well, yes, of course, <laughs> because after all, we we come back to this whole thing of. Um, the Germans just can't quit come because of Hitler, Hitler, Hitler. Hitler, um, Hitler. Hitler. <laughs> well, 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 too. <laughs> well, well, too. Right, OK. Well, we've, we've sort of, um, we've left loads to answer for next time. Um, uh, uh, thank you all very much for listening. Um, thanks for listening. We're, we'll be back on Thursday with the final instalment of Matt McKinnon-Patson's astonishing account of his war experiences. Um, 
and we'll be live streaming on Thursday evening as ever. Join us for lots of fun and hopefully some intriguing historical chat. A reminder, we do the live show. We do the show, what you're seeing now, we do live on the internet every Thursday night with a message stream from our um, regulars, sort of more than 500 every Thursday of the fellow afflicted join us. And you can watch us um, drink nice wine or Calvados and chat war. Um, as James Holland says, what's not to like? See you soon. Cheerio. Cheerio, everyone. <laughs>